A warm welcome once again at our online worship service. Thank you for joining us, especially those of you who have joined us for the first time. Our church are based in Ruedepoort, a suburb of Johannesburg in South Africa, and we have been blessed to minister in our community for almost 40 years. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we, as many other churches, decided to incorporate an online ministry with the use of technology. And although we are predominantly Afrikaans speaking, we also decided to start with an English online service for English speaking friends of our church. I pray that the next few moments together would be a blessing and that the Lord will reveal his heart to us today. I also trust that you and your loved ones are all doing well. On the church's calendar, we are in the process of preparing for Advent and we prepare our hearts and minds for celebrating Christmas and the significance of the baby boy Jesus being born into our world. May this Advent season be a blessing to you and your home. I would like to start this service by reading us a few verses from John chapter 1. This is one of the famous Advent texts that help us reflect on Jesus who became man and who lived among us. Let us listen to a few verses and prepare our hearts and minds to meet Christ. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory like Father, like Son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, This is the one, the one I told you was coming after me, but in fact was ahead of me. He has always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. We all live of his generous bounty, gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses and then the exuberant giving and receiving, the endless knowing and understanding. All this came through Jesus, the Messiah. Dear friends, Christ who live among us and dwell in us through his spirit, he invites us into his presence, and therefore I greet you in the wonderful name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to sing a worship song, and when we do, we acknowledge God as our one and only King, our Redeemer and our Provider. You are welcome to sing along by following the words that will appear on the screen. Blessed be 
my heart will choose to say Lord bless it be your name Lord you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say Lord bless it be your name you give and take Let us pray. Dear God, we humble ourselves before you and we come to you with a longing and a thirst that only you can satisfy and quench. We thank you for the opportunity of opening your word once again with expectancy. We know that it is a living and a dynamic word which not only enriches our souls but also give us direction and purpose and meaning in this life. We ask your spirit to meet us now to touch our hearts so that we can be transformed and become more and more like you. Your spirit enriches us with new vision and hope for the future, and your loving presence transforms our hearts to become more and more like you. We pray this in your glorious name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 1. And we will listen to a reading of the first 17 verses in the message translation. The first 17 verses is called the genealogical list or a family tree of Jesus Christ. These lists of names are usually skipped when we read the Bible, but I hope that we can form a new appreciation for the reasons why it is included in the Bible. The theme for today is skeletons in the closet, the genealogy. Of Jesus. Let us listen to the reading together. The family tree of Jesus Christ, David's son, Abraham's son. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had Judah and his brothers, Judah had Perez and Zerah, the mother was Tamar, Perez had Hezron, Hezron had Aram, Aram had Aminadab, Aminadab had Nashon, Nashon had Salmon, Salmon had Boaz, his mother was Rahab, Boaz had Obed, Ruth was the mother, Obed had Jesse, Jesse had David, and David became king. David had Solomon, Uriah's wife was the mother, Solomon had Rehoboam, Rehoboam had Abijah, Abijah had Asa, Asa had Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat had Joram, Joram had Uzziah, Uzziah had Jotham, Jotham had Ahaz, Ahaz had Hezekiah, Hezekiah had Manasseh, Manasseh had Amon, Amon had Josiah, Josiah had Jehoiachin and his brothers, and then the people were taken into the Babylonian exile. When the Babylonian exile ended, Jehoiachin had Shealtiel, Shealtiel had Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel had Abiod, Abiod had Eliakim, Eliakim had Azor, Azor had Zadok, Zadok had Achim, Achim had Eliad, Eliad had Eliza, Eliza had Mathon, Mathon had Jacob, Jacob had Joseph, Mary's husband, the Mary who gave birth to Jesus, the Jesus who was called Christ. Virtually everything in this life has a point of origin, a beginning. 
our ideas, our thoughts, and our life stories, it all started somewhere, especially when it comes to the origin of new life. As we listen to the sermon today, we all have one thing in common. Our life journey started when a loving father and a mother decided to have a baby. Some of us were planned long in advance, and some just arrived unexpected. Planned or unexpected, all life are precious, and all life, especially human life, are part of God's greater plan for this world. Not only did we originate at some stage, but all of us also belong somewhere. We are either part of a family or a household, or a network of people who give meaning and significance to your life. When it comes to families, we know that every family is unique. You and your family members have unique habits and rituals and stories and characteristic traits. And these things are the glue that holds you together and makes you unique. The sad thing about many families is that the stories that distinct them are lost over the years because we either don't recall them or retell them as often as we used to, before technology and before the busyness of life overtook us. Luckily, in recent years, a trend has developed where people are beginning to research their origin. Genealogical research are one of the more important ways people use to track their origin. And in South Africa, organizations like the Genealogical Society of South Africa plays an important role when it comes to researching one's ancestors. At one stage, I was very interested in doing research about the origin of my ancestors. I did research about the Duplessis family. Now, the first Duplessis family arrived in Cape Town by ship from France. And for more than 300 years, we have called South Africa home. As with all families, there were quite a few very successful people bearing our surname. But there were also a few dodgy characters whom one would rather not want to mention in a decent conversation. Now, the Bible also consists of long lists of people's names and places from where they originated. Many of us skip the chapters in the Bible containing genealogical lists because we find it boring and in many cases even unpronounceable. We just don't see the need. But one must remember that nothing included in the Bible is just accidentally. The Jewish writers who inserted these lists of names did so for a very specific reason. If one looked, for example, at the lists of names we find in a book like Numbers, we understand that it was necessary so that future Jews who were born in captivity knew where they come from, what tribe they belonged to, and very importantly, whether they were 100% Jewish. But there was another important reason why the author kept such a secure record of the genealogical registers, and that was to follow the royal bloodline. Even today, we see how important it is to keep a record of the descendants of royals, because those persons can claim the throne. Quite a few years ago, there was a comedy movie called King Ralph. The movie started where an English royal family all came together for a photo shoot. And then the photographer did something wrong and he wiped out the whole family. The whole monarchy was dumped in chaos and that forced the people to begin searching for the nearest relative who was to become king of England. They eventually traced the man and to their shock, it was an ordinary guy living in America, played by the actor John Goodman. Even today, genealogical registers plays a role in determining successes for the throne. And friends, that is exactly why Jesus' family tree was so important. The Gospel writer Matthew knew very well that Jesus was born in very strange circumstances. He knew very well that there would be people who would, who would start rumors and gossip stories about this child that this mother Mary would claim as coming from God, of which Joseph was merely the stepfather. To claim that this baby Jesus were the son of God and the savior of the world would not only make a lot of people angry, but also according to tradition, they would have the family tree of Jesus examined thoroughly to make sure that he is who he says he is. 
Now, because Matthew was a devout Jew who exclusively wrote to a Jewish audience, one would think that he would go the extra mile to put Jesus and, and especially his family of origin in a positive light. One would think that he would do as we do when we introduce ourselves to a stranger. When we introduce ourselves, we don't start by telling people about our mistakes or even the dodgy characters in our family. None of us will just voluntarily open the proverbial cupboard doors and display our skeletons to each other. But to our shock, that is exactly what Matthew does. It is as if he wanted to stop all the critics in their tracks and don't give them any ammunition to cause any havoc. Matthew decides to hold nothing back and he opens the cupboard doors of Jesus' family tree and in the process a whole bunch of skeletons fall out of there. The expression skeletons in the closet has been used for centuries. It was actually used first in reference to corpse robbers who stole and hid bodies and then later sold them so that doctors in training could do autopsies. Back in the day it was illegal to operate on corpses. But later, it became a saying to say someone was hiding something in the cupboard to spare others shame and discomfort. The famous author George Bernard Shaw defines it this way. Skeletons in the closet are those hidden details of the past that evoke shame, embarrassment, pain, sadness, anger or other negative connotations when they first come to light. With that in mind, let us look at some skeletons in Jesus' genealogy. The one who will be the least shocking was Jesus' mother Mary. Now, although Mary did not have any major scandals that one can highlight, she was like every other human being born into sin. And despite this fact and the gossip in her birth town over the illegitimate child she was expecting, she an ordinary teenager was chosen to carry the Savior and to care for him until the time was ripe for him to live out his calling. But as I said, Mary's shame is small in comparison of what were to come. The second skeleton in the closet is none other than King David. King David in those days was the anchor to which each family tree were attached. He is the epitome of the royal family. And therefore, this beloved king is specifically mentioned so that Jesus can be directly linked to the royal bloodline. People can be convinced that he truly is the Messiah. But the darling king was also one of the rulers who made many awful mistakes during his dynasty. His own family was in shambles and we read a lot about his failure as a father in 1 Samuel. His most famous mistake was when he started an affair with one of his senior officer's wives, a woman called Bathsheba. Not only did David have an affair, but also planned the death of her husband so that he can marry her. Despite David's wrongdoings, he is mentioned in Jesus' family tree. The third skeleton in Jesus' closet was Abram. Abram was a Gentile of origin. His ancestors worshipped idols, and yet God chose this man to become the father of Israel, the chosen people of God. God made a lasting covenant with Abram, promising him that he and all his descendants, including each of us, would live under the protection of the Lord. Now, one would think that when God makes such a profound promise to someone, that that person would live impeccably. But yet, on two occasions, Abram tried to sell his own wife Sarah to foreign kings when he got scared and were in trouble. What a horrible act to do to your own wife, to hire her out and for all practical purposes to be used by a stranger. But yet this man is mentioned as an ancestor of Jesus. When we read further in this genealogical list of Jesus, we see things even get more complicated. Jewish genealogists usually only mentioned men because it was the men who passed on the family name and the identity to the next generation. And yet there are four more women registered in Jesus' family tree. And the most shocking of all is that none of these women were Jews. So the fourth skeleton in the closet was a woman named Tamar. 
She was the Canaanite daughter-in-law of Judah. We read of her peculiar story in Genesis chapter 38. Tamar married one of Judas' sons, but before they could have children, her husband died. Fearing that she will end up on the street, she disguised herself as a prostitute and seduced her own father-in-law. In the process, she became pregnant with Judas' child. One would think that a story like that belongs on a reality TV show, and yet Matthew included it for everyone to read. It was part of Jesus' beginning. But just before you think it can't get worse, then Rahab appears on the scene. She is the fifth skeleton in Jesus' closet. We read about her for the first time in the book of Joshua. Rahab made no secret of her profession. She was a prostitute and entertained many male travelers and visitors to the city of Jericho. But she was also the person who risked her life and hid two Israeli spies in her apartment. And by doing so, they were able to gather valuable information that was later used to destroy the city of Jericho. In exchange for her obedience and faith, God spared her and her family. She later married Solomon, and they had a son named Boaz. Her popularity increased so much that the writers of James and the letter to the Hebrews referred to her as someone extraordinary. Who would have thought that a prostitute would form part of Jesus' family tree? The sixth skeleton in the closet is a Moabite woman named Ruth. Now Ruth's ancestors were idol worshippers and great enemies of the Israelites. Due to famine, she and her mother-in-law Naomi had to return to Israel. And here she meets Boaz. Although Moabites were not allowed to marry Israelites, God made provision for this. And so Boaz marries her and Ruth became the grandmother of King David. The seventh and the final skeleton in the closet is David's mistress Bathsheba. She is also included in the royal genealogy from which Jesus would be born. But her only claim to fame was infidelity to her husband. She also experienced a lot of hardship when her firstborn son died, but later on gave birth to the famous and the wise King Solomon, who were to succeed his father David as king. My friends, I think you will all agree that none of these people would voluntarily end up in the family photo album, especially if one were to think of Jesus' family album. His family tree is the last place you expect skeletons in the closet. But here lies the secret and the power of God's character. God includes all these people in his great plan regardless and despite their mistakes from the past their unreliable character, and even their future failures. Why does he do such a strange thing? Matthew's genealogy wants to reveal something about God, in particular for each one of us and our households. In the first place, we should say God transformed the biggest mistakes and shames and circumstances into opportunities of new growth. The people in Jesus' family tree represent a variety of stories, some of them even horrible stories. In some cases, for some of us, these life stories would mean the end of the road and the breaking up of a relationship, but not for God. Abram's shameful behavior did not stop God from giving him an offspring. Jacob, who deceived his own brother and father, were chosen by God to become the founding father of Israel. Joseph was sold as a slave by his brothers, and although he had to endure many years of hardship, none of these things could stop God from carrying out his plans. Failure and misfortune is never a dead end when it comes to God. I do not know exactly what the skeletons in your family closet is today. Maybe many of them feel like failures to you. Maybe you had a very difficult childhood never got enough recognition from your parents. Maybe you had to hear all your life that your brother or your sister is cuter or smarter or better than you. Maybe someone in your family is struggling with an addiction and you have to come up with one lie after another just to keep an appearance with other people. Maybe you are going through a terrible divorce or you are trapped in a loveless marriage. Maybe you are financially in debt 
and see no light at the end of the tunnel, or you have lost your way because of wrongful decisions. Remember this. Failure in your eyes is possibilities of new growth in God's eyes. God can change broken and hopeless circumstances and write new stories of hope and healing and reconciliation. He made it possible by giving us his most precious possession, his only son. Through him who endured suffering and conquered death, anything is possible, even new life out of life's tragedy. But there is a second point I would like to highlight. God uses people who have been written off by society. When we think about it, Jesus' family tree is a mere cross-section of the society of which we are all part. God allowed his perfect son to have imperfect ancestors because these were exactly the kind of people he wanted to come and save. The murderers, the deceivers, the unbelievers, the liars, the sinners, and yes, even people like you and me. In our society, people are written off very easily. We judge so quickly and we would rather associate ourselves with people who are beneficial to us and our image. It happens in the best of families as well. We would rather hold on to mistakes of the past and to keep family feuds alive than by forgiving and reconciling. Our families and our homes then become war zones rather than safe spaces where we accept each other and tolerate each other. We too easily forget that the one who actually had all the right to write us off, Jesus Christ, the one who were deserted by us, still offered his life to each one of us out of love. Instead of writing people off, we have to start looking at each other through his eyes, eyes that sees potential where the world only sees a dead end or failure. I would like to conclude and say the following. Genealogy records are an example of how unpredictable life can be. Think about it. If there was the slightest change in your family tree, if your great-grandparents or your grandparents and in the end your parents' path did not cross each other, then none of us would be here today. Now you may say to me, yes, but that's just how things worked out. It's just coincidence. But think about it. If I were to tell you centuries ago that you must ensure that you will be born in this day and age with all your unique traits and gifts and keeping in mind that there are many different variables to deal with, what are the chances of you sitting here today and listening to this sermon? Our past and our future are not in our own hands. We were destined to be here because of what the Lord did and is still doing in our lives. It is not a coincidence that you are part of a certain earthly family. Not a coincidence that you are living in this day and age. You are not the only the apple of your father and your mother's eyes, but you are also chosen by God. Your uniqueness and your value before God surpasses your past, the skeletons in your closet and even future mistakes. When God looks at you, he doesn't only see mistakes, but he sees your worth as being one of his image bearers and what you can become. If God could include lists of people with dodgy resumes in Jesus' family tree, he could surely include us too. You are not defined by past choices and mistakes. God included stories of broken people so that we can also celebrate our own brokenness and know it is not the end of the road. Being part of a household or a family or even an intimate network of relationships is one of the ways God blesses us. Within this intimate space, we learn to celebrate life. We learn to forgive one another. We learn to accept one another unconditionally, to say sorry when we are at fault, to love one another, to support and encourage one another, and sometimes to tolerate each other. No household or family or network of relationships is perfect. We do life together. We celebrate the highs but also share the messiness of life. 
like trees, we change and grow through life seasons together. And as the years go by, we share a common story which entails many blessings, but also painful recollections as well. But that doesn't stop us from being family. We embrace both the good and the bad. God used Matthew to show us that you never have to be ashamed of your past, your family, or even your place in that family. God used Matthew to show us that he does not need perfect families, only obedient and believing families. He will do the rest. I conclude with the saying of George Bernard Shaw, who also said, If you cannot get rid of the family skeleton, you may as well make it dance. Accept your past, accept your shortcomings and your mistakes, but give it to God and allow him to help you and to use it for his glory. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the reassurance today that we belong to your family. Thank you for reaffirming us that our past mistakes and choices do not define us. Where we see a dead end, you see possibilities of new growth. You look at us with soft eyes and our past failures are mere building blocks on which you will build new stories of hope and healing and restoration. Thank you for the family tree of Jesus on which we could reflect today and thank you that we could see ourselves in the examples Matthew used. In your hands, our lives have meaning and purpose. You partner with us to build your kingdom and to spread a message of hope and peace. Bless us during the Advent season and help us to appreciate you becoming flesh and living among us, but also to celebrate this Christmas season with the right attitude. Bless every home, every family and every person who joined us in this service today. Thank you for your love, your guidance and your protection. We pray this. In your precious name. Amen. Dear friends, through your gracious contributions, we are able to sustain our ministry. Thank you for empowering us to keep on serving families facing great difficulty and challenges in this time. You empower us to serve people in need with food parcels and with clothes, subsidies for chronic medication and basic needs. If you would like to strengthen our efforts to keep doing so, you are welcome to make a contribution by following the details on the next screen. Friends, we are going to conclude our service by singing another worship song. May the Lord be exalted through our praise. Let us worship the Lord. that the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh his free Save. 
Thank you so much for watching and listening to our service today. Feel free to share this message with someone in need of some hope and encouragement in the coming week. And may you and your home be blessed and experience the protection and the provision of the Lord. Let us receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. Amen.